Good afternoon, and thanks so much for coming out to this program of music for the King of Instruments. Um, and you came out through the rain. It's actually a great sign to have rain on the day of an organ concert because it increases uh, the amount of the way the music hangs in the air. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> um, can I see a show of hands as if this is your first ever organ concert that you've gone to? Oh, wonderful, great. I'm very glad you're here. Hopefully it will not be your last. You may wonder why the organ is considered the king of instruments. It is undoubtedly because of its size, its complexity, its power, and its dynamic range. Um, can anyone tell me without researching on your phones what famous composer gave the organ that title of being the, the king of instruments? Anyone have an idea? Mozart, excellent. Sister Marianne, you get a, a gold star. Great. Um, so I thought we should start off today by singing a hymn, hopefully one you all know, with a text appropriate for this season of creation. One of the primary reasons organs have been developed is to enable the prayer and praise of God and to support the singing of the faithful. So I have three requests. First of all, sing with full heart and voice. Before the final verse, there will be a two-measure interlude uh, that modulates up to a higher key. And notice how the varied registration or variety of sounds programmed adds variety in color and might also reflect what the text is about. I will play an eight measure introduction uh, to set the tempo and remind you of this tune. Um, if you all want to stand.
Well done with the singing. The next movements of the Capriole Suite were originally composed for a piano duet in 1926 and later arranged by Warlock for string orchestra, which is generally how we hear them perform today. My music looks like a piano score, but listen for an increased depth to the sound when I'm playing the pedals. It's by English composer Peter Warlock, who only lived to the age of 36, dying tragically by suicide. It's based on tunes found in a manual of Renaissance dances. If you're familiar with Renaissance dancing, by all means, feel free to get up and dance at any point. I've never actually heard these played on the organ, so this is called uh, like playing an organ transcription. So you may be the first to hear them on the organ. I will introduce the descriptions of the movements as we go along. We'll start with bossa dance, which is stately. And um, in this dance, the feet would not be raised, but would glide across the floor. Sweet are all these movements. The Pervantin is a slow processional dance.
we have Tordion, which is a triple meter lively dance. The title comes from the fr French word tordre, meaning to twist. And see if you can tell on which note I, which keyboard I play the final note of the piece. Uh, there will be a quiz at the end. Notice where I, well, what keyboard I played the last note? The pedal, exactly. Nancy was watching. Thank you, Dr. Mink. <laughs> okay, super. Um, the next piece, Peds and Lair, literally means feet in the air. Dancers would perform this dance as if their feet barely touched the floor. It's the the most uh, soft lyrical movement of the piece, of the suite. we have the sword dance. It's very quick, very lively, very noisy. You will be able to imagine a 16th century sword dance as you listen to this movement.
you. I would next like to welcome Georgia Sigler, a senior at St. Mary's College and vocal performance major, to join me on this next piece to help demonstrate how the organ can be used as a continuo or accompanying instrument. As there are very quick manual changes between the solo organ and accompaniment, I set up two different levels of registration, one on the upper swell keyboard and the other on the lower great keyboard um, so that the interludes sound brighter than when Georgia is singing to, to keep her voice in the forefront. Um, Bach wrote this cantata for Pentecost Monday. Can any of the St. Mary's students tell me what we celebrate on Pentecost? Anyone? Pentecost. <laughs> the coming of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Tess. Very good. So this uh, movement was written back in 1725, nearly 300 years ago. English conductor John Elliott Gardner describes it as surely one of Bach's most refreshing and unbuttoned expressions of melodic joy and high spirits. I hope you agree.
Beautiful, Georgia. Um, let's see. No concert demonstrating the organ could leave out music by the master of the Baroque era, German composer Johann Sebastian Bach, whom you just heard. He wrote this next work sometime between 1710 and 1717 while in Weimar. The piece was clearly inspired by Buxtehude, a German organist composer uh, who started writing a bit earlier than Bach, and uh, Bach even went to hear him play the organ at one point. Toccata comes from the Italian toccare, meaning to touch. It sounds improvised. It has to be played by listening to the sound of the organ in the acoustic, in the room. And also, it has to be played as if you have something important to say. I'd say almost conversational in nature. As a performer, I can tell a great piece of music as when I'm always discovering new things about a particular piece and different ways to play it. You can never wear it out. The articulation is different in Baroque music as there needs to be some air between the notes to allow them to speak clearly in the room, especially in a very um, uh, lively acoustic as we have here. Uh, that is a challenge to make happen when the notes are going by super fast. The adagio is a big contrast in style. It's less improvisatory sounding, more metered in, the, in A minor, the relative minor to C major. And you'll hear um, the, gr the great keyboard being used for the solo voice, and then I'm accompanying that solo voice both on the pedals and in the upper swell keyboard. It ends in a short grave movement, more improvisatory in style, and it builds in tension and drama, moving us into the fugue. The fugue has an exposition of a theme that we hear in a single melodic line before all four vo voices are woven in together. Bach was the master fugue writer. I would like to challenge you to write your own fugue sometime. It's a very tricky task. This meter of the fugue is in 6-8, so it's felt in a big two pattern. It's basically a dance, which is why an organist always wears dance shoes when we play the organ. Actually, one of the most delightful things about being an organist is you can wear sparkly shoes and you can bedazzle them, as I did for my last organ concert at Westminster Abbey in London, which was really a thrill. You will notice I'm playing with both feet, with toes as well as heels, and you have to be as relaxed as possible so you don't become tangled up in all the notes. Wish me luck, and if you want to dance a bit as I play the fugue, that would be delightful.
Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, in preparing for this concert, since we're at a college for women, I felt it appropriate to include some music by female composers as I enjoy composition myself. But in my own library search, I realized how painfully small my own organ collection is by female composers. I'm going to do my best to correct that in the future. In fact, one of our Holy Cross sisters, Sister Marie Cecile, who wrote and published music, had to do so under the pseudonym of a man's name, Gerald Reen. Not surprising for the time period, but frustrating for her, I am sure. Anyway, Nadia Boulanger was one of the most important composition teachers of the 20th, of the 20th century. She was French and principally taught in Paris, but also in England and the US. She taught American composers Aaron Copland, Virgil Thompson, and the conductor Daniel Barenboim, among others. Trailblazer that she was, she was also the first woman to conduct many major orchestras in Europe and the US. Most notably, her students did not try to copy her compositional style, but they all developed their own distinct styles. I would love to have had the ability to eavesdrop on some of her classes. Anyway, this next piece is from a set of three improvisations. An improvisation is a spontaneous performance without specific preparation or scripted prep. I am registering the piece on the softer side so you can listen to all the changes in the key areas without being overly distracted. The piece begins in F minor, moves through different key areas, returns to F minor, there are more harmonic transitions, and the piece ends beautifully in F major, played on the purest flute sounds I could find. I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoy playing it.
you. I am going to skip ahead just a little bit, and that's fine. I know if, if some students need to leave, uh, because officially the, the, their class hour here just ends at 4.20, so I am completely not offended. Um, but I am skipping ahead to Cortez and Litany. Um, so you, by now you probably notice that I really like French music. There's quite a bit on this program. Uh, and yes, uh, so does anyone know what cortege means in French, the translation? Uh, that the definition is a funeral procession, and of course a litany is a prayer with repetitive chant, such as we sing with our litany of saints. You'll notice that the piece begins quite dark sounding with very low pitches, um, but I'm playing in the middle of the keyboard um, that's because if I add 16-foot stops, they sound an octave lower than normal piano pitch. Um, I will, before I play the piece, I'll demonstrate just a little bit of the complicated feet crossing that happens midway through the piece, where the organist has to go into Spider-Man mode, as they call it. I chose this piece because it's well-crafted and it takes the listener from the quietest sounds of the organ up to a triple forte. It also features double pedaling where two different melodies are played by, simultaneously by both feet and this happens for the last three pages of the piece. Uh, the composer was known as the Paganini of the organ. He presented over 2,000 recitals in his lifetime and was a professor at the Paris Conservatoire. He also trained two generations of famous organists, including Jean and Marie Claire Alain, Jean Langlais, and Olivia Messiaen, to name a few.
Thank you so much. Great. Now, as we uh, head into the last piece, you get to sing one more time as one of the things the organ does best is help unify people as it helps support the singing of an assembly. This is a hymn popular in Anglican churches with the tune Hanover. I was happy to find it on my bookshelf in the 1982 Episcopal hymnal. The text is based on Psalm 104, a hymn of praise. I will play through the tune before we sing it together. Then I'll end with a fugue based on this tune. It integrates up to five different voices and ends with big chords and more double pedaling as you just saw in the last piece. So my feet are getting a workout today. Elizabeth Sterling was a 19th century English composer and organist. She attended the Royal Academy of Music in London. Her music is not that very well known or recorded. In fact, I could not even find this piece on YouTube, and that says a lot. <laughs> I did find the score on IMSLP, and someone scanned it from the Royal College of Music Library, to whom I am greatly indebted. Thanks again to Georgia Sigler for assisting today, and for my dear colleague Carrie Bowie, Director of Liturgy, um, who, uh, for her help in facilitating the camera so the sisters can watch remotely in their rooms in the convent uh, for helping uh, move out the organ console so it's easier for you to see it, and also for her wonderful help with page turning today. So thanks to each of you for coming to this program. I hope it gives you a good taste of music for the organ, how it's played, and a glimpse into its fabulous repertoire. And now let's all have you all stand as we sing this hymn, and then you're welcome to be seated for the fugue.